We have now seen how Oxley, prevented from following the river down by an overflow amongst the marshes, turned southwest, only to be driven back by impenetrable scrubs and general aridity. He struck north with the hope of shortly regaining the too well watered country he had left. The fixed idea of the utterly useless nature of the country is ever present in his mind as he proceeds. On the 21st June, he writes, quote, The farther we proceed northwesterly, the more convinced I am that for all the practical purposes of civilised men, the interior of this country, westward of a certain meridian, is uninhabitable, deprived as it is of wood, water and grass. End quote. A sweeping and hasty condemnation this, considering that the threshold of the interior had been scarcely more than crossed. On the 23rd of June, the travellers suddenly and unexpectedly came upon the river again, an incident, as the leader says, little expected by anyone. The next day they started once more to follow down the stream, with brighter hopes of better success until, on the 7th of July, progress was once more arrested, and Oxley turned back, recording in his journal, quote, It is with infinite regret and pain that I was forced to come to the conclusion that the interior of this vast country is a marsh and uninhabitable. End quote. The party now retraced their steps to the eastward, disgusted with the want of success that had attended their efforts and the dreary monotony of their surroundings. Quote, there is a uniformity in the barren desolateness of this country which wearies one more than I am able to express. One tree, one soil, one water, and one description of bird, fish, or animal prevails alike for ten miles and for one hundred. A variety of wretchedness is at all times preferable to one unvarying cause of pain or distress, end quote. On the 4th of August, being then satisfied of their position on the river, and knowing that a further course along its bank would only lead them amongst the swamps that had stayed their downward journey, it was determined to strike to the north-eastward, in order to avoid this low country and, if possible, reach the Macquarie River and follow it up the settlement of Bathurst. After experiencing some difficulty in manufacturing a raft out of pine logs, whereby to cross their baggage over, Oxley and his party left the Lachlan. They endured for some time a repetition of their struggles in the south for grass and water, and then the explorers reached fertile and well-watered country, and on the 19th of August halted on the bank of the Macquarie, which river Oxley found to equal his fondest hopes. They now turned their steps homeward and arrived at Bathurst on the evening of the 29th of August. Convinced that in the Macquarie he had now discovered the highway into the interior, Oxley writes, quote, Nothing can afford a stronger contrast than the two rivers, Lachlan and Macquarie. Different in their habit, their appearance and the sources from which they derive their waters, but above all, differing in the country bordering on them the one constantly receiving great accession of water from four streams and is liberally rendering fertile a great extent of country, whilst the other, from its source to its termination, is constantly diffusing and diminishing the waters it originally receives over low and barren deserts, creating only wet flats and uninhabitable morasses, and during its protracted and sinuous course is never indebted to a single tributary stream. End quote. Oxley, having successfully carried through the Lachlan expedition, was at once selected to command a similar one down the Macquarie, on which, now that the former river had so disappointed expectations, men's hopes were fixed. Oxley seems to have been particularly unhappy in his deductions, Every guess hazarded by him as to the future utility of the country he passed over, or the probable nature of the farther interior, was incorrect. 
and now the Macquarie was to refuse to bear his boat's keel to the westward, after the same manner as the Lachlan. In those days, men had not yet mastered the idea that the physical formation of Australia was not to be worked out on the same lines as that of other countries. They looked vainly for a river with a wide and noble opening, and none being found on the surveyed coast, conjecture placed it far away in a few leagues of unexplored shoreline on the northwest. The constancy with which the southern coast had been examined precluded all idea from men's minds that the entrance to this long-sought river was there. No, it must be yet undiscovered to the westward. Wentworth says, quote, If the sanguine hopes to which the discovery of this river, the Macquarie, has given birth should be realised and it should be found to empty itself into the ocean on the northwest coast, which is the only part of this vast island that has not been accurately surveyed, in what mighty conceptions of the future greatness and power of this colony may we not reasonably indulge? The nearest distance from the point at which Mr Oxley left off to any part of the western coast is very little short of 2,000 miles. If this river, therefore, be already of the size of the Hawkesbury at Windsor, which is not less than 250 yards in breadth, and of sufficient depth to float a 74-gun ship, it is not difficult to imagine what must be its magnitude at its confluence with the ocean, before it can arrive at which it has to traverse a country nearly 2,000 miles in extent. If it possesses the usual sinuosities of rivers, its course to the sea cannot be less than from five to six thousand miles, and the endless accession of tributary streams which it must receive in its passage through so great an extent of country will without doubt enable it to vie in point of magnitude with any river in the world. End quote. It may therefore well be imagined that it was in a most sanguine spirit that Oxley undertook his second journey. As before, a party had been sent ahead to build boats and get everything in readiness, and on the 6th June 1818 he started on his second expedition into the interior. He had with him, as next in command, the indefatigable Evans, Dr. Harris, who had volunteered, Charles Fraser, botanist, and 12 men, 18 horses, 2 boats, and provisions for 24 weeks. On the 23rd of the month, having reached a distance of nearly 125 miles from the depot in Wellington Valley, without the travellers experiencing more obstruction than might have been expected, two men, Thomas Thatcher and John Hall, were sent back to Bathurst with a report to Governor Macquarie, as had been previously arranged. No sooner had the two parties separated, one with high hopes of their future success, the others bearing back tidings of these confident hopes, than doubt and distrust entered the mind of the leader. In his journal, written not twenty-four hours after the departure of his messengers, he says, quote, For four or five miles there was no material change in the general appearance of the country from what it had been on the preceding days. But for the last six miles the land was very considerably lower, interspersed with plains clear of timber and dry. On the banks it was still lower, and in many parts it was evident that the river floods swept over them, though this did not appear to be universally the case. These unfavourable appearances threw a damp upon our hopes, and we feared that our anticipations had been too sanguine. End quote. In his after-report to the Governor, forwarded by Mr Evans to Newcastle, he writes, quote, My letter, dated the 22nd June last, will have made Your Excellency acquainted with the sanguine hopes I entertained from the appearance of the river, that its termination would be either in interior waters or coastwise. When I wrote that letter to Your Excellency, I certainly did not anticipate the possibility that a very few days farther travelling would lead us to its termination as an accessible river. End quote. So short-lived were the hopes he had entertained. 
On the 30th of June, after, for many days, finding the country becoming flatter and more liable to floods, Oxley found himself almost hemmed in by water and had to return with the whole party to a safer encampment, where a consultation was held. It was decided to send the horses and baggage back to Mount Harris, a small elevation some 15 miles higher up the river, whilst Oxley himself, with four volunteers and the large boat, proceeded down the river, taking with them a month's provisions. During his absence, Mr Evans was to proceed to the northeast some 60 miles and return upon a more northerly course, this being the direction the party intended taking if the river failed them. Let us see how Oxley fared. Quote, July 2nd. I proceeded down the river during one of the wettest and most stormy days we had yet experienced. About 20 miles from where I set off, there was, properly speaking, no country. The river overflowing its banks and dividing into streams, which I found had no permanent separation from the main branch, but united themselves to it on a multitude of points. We went seven or eight miles farther when we stopped for the night upon a space of ground sparsely large enough to enable us to kindle a fire. The principal stream ran with great rapidity and its banks and neighbourhood as far as we could see were covered with wood, enclosing us within a margin or bank vast spaces of country clear of timber were under water and covered with the common reed which grew to the height of six or seven feet above the surface. The course and distance by the river was estimated to be from 27 to 30 miles on a northwest line. July 3rd. Towards the morning the storm abated, and at daylight we proceeded on our voyage. The main bed of the river was much contracted, but very deep, the waters spreading to a depth of a foot or eighteen inches over the banks, but all running on the same point of bearing. We met with considerable interruption from fallen timber, which in places nearly choked up the channel. After going about twenty miles we lost the land and trees. The channel of the river, which lay through reeds and was from one to three feet deep, ran northerly. This continued for three or four miles further, when, although there had been no previous change in the breadth, depth and rapidity of the stream for several miles, and I was sanguine in my expectations of soon entering the long-sought-for Australian sea, it all at once eluded our further search by spreading on every point from northwest to northeast, amongst the ocean of reeds that surrounded us still running with the same rapidity as before. There was no channel whatever amongst these reeds, and the depth varied from five to three feet. This astonishing change, for I cannot call it a termination of the river, of course left me no alternative but to endeavour to return to some spot on which we could effect a landing before dark. I estimated that on this day we had gone about 24 miles, on nearly the same point of bearing as yesterday. To assert positively that we are on the margin of the lake or sea into which this great body of water is discharged might reasonably be deemed a conclusion which has nothing but conjecture for its basis. But, if an opinion may be permitted to be hazarded from actual appearances, mine is decidedly in favour of our being in the vicinity of an inland sea or lake most probably a shoal one, and gradually filling up by immense depositions from the higher lands, left by the waters which flow into it. It is most singular that the highlands on this continent seem to be confined to the sea coast or not to extend to any distance from it. End quote. Satisfied that to the westward nothing more could be done in the way of exploration, Oxley returned to Mount Harris, where a temporary depot was formed. Mr. Evans immediately started on a trip to the northeast. He was absent ten days, during which time he discovered the Castlereagh River. The weather had set in wet and stormy, the rivers kept rising and falling, and the level country was soft and boggy, excessively tiring to their jaded horses. Moreover, in consequence of the boats being now left behind, the packs were greatly increased in weight. 
On the 20th of July, the whole of the party bade adieu to the Macquarie, which they had once trusted to so fondly, and commenced their journey to the eastern coast, making in the first place for Arbuthnot's range. Before leaving, a bottle was buried on Mount Harris, containing a written scheme of their proposed route and intentions with some silver coin. On July 27th, they reached the bank of the Castle Ray after a hard struggle through the bogs and swamps. The river was flooded and must have risen almost directly after Mr Evans crossed it on his homeward route. It was not until the 2nd of August that the waters fell sufficient to allow them to cross. Still steering for the range, their course lay across shaking quagmires or wading through miles of water. Constantly having to unload and reload the unfortunate horses who could scarcely get through the bog without their packs. Before reaching the range, the party camped at the small hill previously ascended by Mr. Evans. Here they found the compass strangely affected. On placing it on a rock, the card flew around with extreme velocity and then suddenly settled at opposite points, the north point becoming the south. A short distance from the base of the hill, the needle regained its proper position. This hill received the name of Lodestone Hill. Crossing Arbuthnot Range round the northern base of Mount Exmouth, the explorers, although still terribly harassed by the boggy state of the country, found themselves in splendid pastoral land. Hills, dales and plains of the richest description lay before them, and from the elevations the view presented was of the most varied kind. This tract of country was called by Oxley Liverpool Plains. On Mount Tetley and many of the hills about, the same variations of the compass were observed as had formerly been noticed on Lodestone Hill. Through this beautiful district, the party now had a less arduous journey than before, and their horses were able to regain some of their lost strength. On the 2nd of September, they crossed a river which they named the Peel River, and here one of their number narrowly escaped drowning. Still pushing eastward and continuing to travel through beautiful grazing country, Oxley was suddenly stopped by a deep glen running across his track. Quote, this tremendous ravine runs near north and south. Its breadth at the bottom does not apparently exceed 100 or 200 feet, whilst the separation of the outer edges is from 2 to 3 miles. I am certain that in perpendicular depth it exceeds 3,000 feet. The slopes from the edges were so steep and covered with loose stones that any attempt to descend even on foot was impracticable. From either side of this abyss, smaller ravines of similar character diverged, the distance between which seldom exceeded half a mile. Down them trickled small rills of water derived from the range on which we were. We could not, however, discern which way the water in the main valley ran as the bottom was concealed by a thicket of vines and creeping plants. End quote. This barrier turned them to the south, and afterwards to the west again on the way, they met with a grand fall 150 feet in height, which they named Beckett's Cataract. At the head of the glen they found another fall, which they estimated at 230 feet in height. Crossing above this cataract, which was called Bathurst's Fall, the eastern course was once more resumed, and tempests and storms found them wandering amongst the deep ravines and gloomy forests of the coast range, seeking for a descent to the lower lands. On the 23rd of September, Oxley, accompanied by Evans, ascended a mountain to try and discover a practicable route, and from there caught sight of the sea. Quote, Bilboa's ecstasy at the first sight of the South Sea could not have been greater than ours when, on gaining the summit of this mountain, we beheld old ocean at our feet. It inspired us with new life. Every difficulty vanished in imagination we were already home. End quote. Now commenced the final descent, and a perilous one it was. Quote, How the horses descended I scarcely know and the bare recollection of the imminent dangers which they escaped makes me tremble.' 
At one period of the descent, I would willingly have compromised for a loss of one-third of them to ensure the safety of the remainder. It is to the exertions and steadiness of the men under providence that their safety must be ascribed. The thick tufts of grass and the loose soil also gave them a surer footing of which the men skilfully availed themselves. End quote. They were now on a river running direct to the sea, which was named the Hastings River, and which the party followed down with more or less trouble until they reached a port at the mouth of it, which the explorer, after the fashion of the day, immediately dubbed Port Macquarie. It is an unfortunate thing for New South Wales that such an absence of originality with regard to naming newly discovered places was displayed by the travellers of that time. On the 12th of October, the Wanderers made a final start for home, commencing a toilsome march along the south coast. Stopped and interrupted for a time by many inlets and creeks, they at last came upon a boat buried in the sand, which had belonged to a Hawkesbury vessel lost some time before. This boat they carried with them as far as Port Stephens, where they arrived on the 1st of November, using it to facilitate the passage of the salt water arms. During the latter part of this wearisome journey, they were much harassed by unprovoked attacks by the natives, and one of the men, William Black, was dangerously wounded, being speared through the back and in the lower part of the body. Oxley had thus, after innumerable hardships and dangers, brought his party, with the exception of the wounded men, back in safety to the settlements. True, he had not fulfilled the mission he was dispatched on, but he had discovered large tracts of valuable land fit for settlement. He had crossed the formidable coast range far away to the north and established the fact that communications between his newly discovered port and the interior were practicable. Oxley's expeditions were both well equipped and well carried out. He also had the assistance of able and zealous coadjutors, each or any of them being capable of assuming the leadership in case of misfortune. His travels may be said to inaugurate the series of brilliant exploits in the field of exploration that we are about to enter on. In 1819, Mr. Oxley and Meehan, accompanied by young Hume, made a short excursion to Jarvis Bay, Oxley returning by sea, his companions overland. The era of the pioneer squatter had now commenced, henceforth exploration and pastoral enterprise went hand in hand. North and south of the new town of Bathurst, the advance of the flocks and herds went on. Oxley's report may have somewhat checked a westerly migration, but the stay in that direction was not doomed to last long. Northward, to and beyond the Kujigong River and the fertile valley of the Upper Hunter, southward toward the mysterious Murrumbidgee, which was now reported as having been found by the settlers, pressed the pioneers. It is not known who was the first discoverer of this river. Hume, in company with Throsby, must have been close to it during the various excursions, and in 1821 Hume discovered Yass Plains, almost on its bank. It was, however, destined to be the future highway to the undiscovered land of the West. In 1822, Mrs. Lawson and Scott attempted to reach Liverpool Plains, Oxley's great discovery from Bathurst. They were, however, unable to penetrate the range that formed the southern boundary of the plains and returned, having discovered a new river at the foot of the range, which they named the Goulburn. In 1823, Oxley, Cunningham and Curry were all in the field in different directions. On the 22nd of May, Captain Mark John Curry, RN, accompanied by Brigade Major Ovens and having with them Joseph Wilde, a notable bushman, started on an exploratory trip south of Lake George. On the 1st of June, they came to the Murrumbidgee, as it was then called, and followed up the bank of it, looking for a crossing. The day before, they had caught sight of a high range of mountains to the southward, partially snow-topped. In their progress along the river, they came to fine open downs and plains, which, with the singularly bad taste which still unfortunately holds sway, Curry immediately named after the then-governor, 
Brisbane Downs. Although but a short time before, they had learnt from the Aborigines the native name of Monaroo. Fortunately, in this instance, Monaroo has been preserved and Brisbane Downs forgotten. On the 6th of June, they crossed the river and found the open country still stretching south, bounded to the west by the snowy mountains they had formerly seen, and to the east by a range that they took to be the coast range. Their provisions being limited, they turned back and reached Throsby's farm of Bong Bong on the 14th of the same month. Cunningham, meantime, during the months of April, May and June, was busily engaged in the country north of Bathurst. He had two purposes in view, his pursuit as a botanist and the discovery of a pass through the northern range onto Liverpool Plains, which Lieutenant Lawson had been unable to find. On reaching the range, he searched vainly to the eastward for any valley that would enable him to pierce the barrier and had to retrace his steps and seek more to the west. Here he came upon a pass which he called Pandora's Pass and which he found to be practicable as a stock route to the plains. He returned to Bathurst on the 27th of June. In October, Oxley started from Sydney on a very different kind of expedition to those lately undertaken by him. His mission now was to examine the inlets of Port Curtis, Moreton Bay and Port Bowen with a view to forming a penal establishment there. On the 21st of October, therefore, in 1823, he left in the colonial cutter Mermaid, accompanied by Mr. Stirling and Uniaki. At Port Macquarie, Oxley had the pleasure of seeing the settlement that had so rapidly sprung up on his recommendation of the suitability of the port. Further on, they discovered and named the Tweed River. On the 6th November, the Mermaid anchored in Port Curtis. Here the party remained for some time and found and christened the Boyne River. Oxley's report was unfavourable. Quote, Having viewed and examined with the most anxious attention every point that afforded the least promise of being eligible for the site of a settlement, I respectfully submit it as my opinion that Port Curtis and its vicinity do not afford such a site and I do not think that any convict establishment could be formed there that would return either from the natural productions of the country or, as arising from agricultural labour, any portion of the great expense which would necessarily attend its first formation. End quote. As it was too late in the season to examine Port Bowen, the mermaid went south, entered Moreton Bay and anchored off the river that Flinders had christened Pummerstone River, heading from the Glasshouse Peaks, here a singular adventure occurred, written by Mr. Uniaki. Quote, Scarcely was the anchor let go when we perceived a number of natives at a distance of about a mile advancing rapidly towards the vessel, and on looking at them with the glass and the masthead, I observed one who appeared much larger than the rest, and of a lighter colour being a light copper, while all their others were black. End quote. This light-coloured native turned out to be a white man, one Thomas Pamphlet. In company with three others, he had left Sydney in an open boat to bring cedar from the Five Islands, but being driven out to sea by a gale, they had suffered terrible hardships, being, so he stated, at one time 21 days without water, during which time one man had died of thirst. Finally, they were wrecked on Morton Island and had lived with the blacks ever since, a period of seven months. Pamphlet informed them that his two companions were named Finnegan and Parsons, and that they had started to make for Sydney overland, but after going some 50 miles, he, Pamphlet, returned, and shortly afterwards was joined by Finnegan, who had quarrelled with Parsons. The latter was never heard of. Next day, Finnegan turned up, and both he and Pamphlet agreed that at the south end of the bay there was a large river. Mr. Oxley and Stirling started the following morning in the whale boat to look for it, taking Finnegan with them. They found the river and pulled up at about 50 miles, being greatly satisfied with the discovery. Not being provided for a longer trip, Oxley turned back at a point he named Termination Hill, which he ascended, and from which he obtained a fine view of the further course of the river. Still haunted by his inland lake theory, and as usual drawing erroneous deductions, he writes, quote, 
The nature of the country and a consideration of all the circumstances connected with the appearance of the river justify me in entertaining a strong belief that the sources of the river will not be found in mountainous country, but rather that it flows from some lake which will prove to be the receptacle of those interior streams crossed by me during an expedition of discovery in 1818. End quote. This river, Oxley named the Brisbane, and taking with them the two rescued men, the mermaid set sail for Sydney, where the party arrived on December 13th. With regard to the shipwrecked men, it may be here mentioned that their conviction at the time they were found was that they were to the south of Sydney, somewhere in the neighbourhood of Jarvis Bay. Oxley's work and his life, too, were now almost at a close. He died at Kirkham, his private residence near Sydney, on the 25th of May, 1828. He had been essentially a successful explorer, for although he had not in every case attained the issue aimed at, he had always brought his men back in safety, and had opened up vast tracts of new country. The journey made by Mr. Hume and Hovell across to Port Phillip has a character of its own, being the first successful trip undertaken from shore to shore, from the eastern to the southern coast. The expedition originated from a somewhat wild idea that entered the head of that unpopular governor, Sir Thomas Brisbane. Surveyor General Oxley, not having determined the question as to whether any large rivers entered the sea between Cape Otway and Spencer's Gulf, excepting to his own satisfaction, Sir Thomas Brisbane bit upon the scheme of landing a party of pioneers near Wilson's Promontory, and inducing them, by the offer of a free pardon and a land grant, to find their way to Sydney overland and that they should have a better chance of eventually turning up, it was recommended that an experienced bushman should be put in charge of them. The flattering, if somewhat dangerous, offer of this position was made to Mr Hume, who, on consideration, declined it. He, however, offered to conduct a party from Lake George, then the outermost station, or nearly so, to the western port, if the government provided necessary assistance. The government accepted his offer, but forgot to provide the assistance. This caused much delay and vexation, and Mr Hovell offering to join the party and find half the necessary men and cattle, the government agreed to do something in the matter. This something amounted to six pack saddles and gear, one tent of Parramatta cloth, two tarpaulins, a suit of slop clothes each for the men, two skeleton charts for tracing their journey, a few bush utensils, and the following promise, a cash payment for the hire of the cattle should any important discovery be made. This money was refused on the return of the party, and Mr Hume states that he had even much difficulty in obtaining tickets of leave for the men, and an order to select 1,200 acres of land for himself. Mr Hovell was a retired shipmaster, who had been for some time settled in Australia, each of the leaders brought with them three men, so that the strength of the expedition was eight men in all. They had with them two carts, five bullocks, and three horses. On October 14, 1824, the party left Lake George. On reaching the Murrumbidgee, they found it flooded, and after waiting three days and the river continuing the same, an attempt was made to cross, and by means of the body of a cart rigged up as a punt with a tarpaulin, they succeeded. On the south side of the river they found the country broken and somewhat difficult to make good progress through, but it was all well grassed and adapted to grazing purposes. Here, as might have been anticipated, they soon had to leave their carts behind and pack their cattle for the remainder of their journey. Following the Murrumbidgee, after a short distance, they left it for a southwest course, which still led them through hills and valleys rich with good grass and running water. On November 8th, they were destined to enjoy a sight never before witnessed by white men in Australia. Ascending a range in order to get a view of the country ahead of them, they suddenly came in front of snow-capped mountains. There, under the brilliant sun of an Australian summer's day, rose lofty peaks that might have found a fitting home in some far polar clime, covered as they were for nearly one-fourth of their height with glistening snow. Skirting this range, which was called the Australian Alps, the travellers, after eight days wandering through the spurs of the lofty mountains they had just seen, came on a fine flowing river, which Mr Hume named, after his father, the Hume, 
destined to be afterwards called the Murray when visited lower down. Failing to find a ford, a makeshift boat was constructed by the aid of the useful tarpaulin, and the passage of the Hume safely accomplished. Still passing through good available country watered by fine flowing streams, on the 24th they crossed the Ovens River, and on the 3rd of December they came to another river, which they called the Hovel, now the Goulburn, and on the 16th of the same month reached the seashore, near where Geelong now stands. Two days afterwards they commenced their return, and on the 18th of January arrived at Lake George. This exploration had a great and lasting bearing on the extension of Australian settlement. A few years after one of the highest authorities then in the colony had deemed the western interior, beyond a certain limit, unfitted for human habitation, and expressed his opinion that the monotonous flats over which he vainly looked for any rise extended almost to the sea coast, snow-clad mountains, feeding innumerable streams were discovered to the south of his track. The successful and arduous expedition, led by the young native-born explorer, had the twofold effect of exposing Oxley's fallacies and teaching a lesson of caution to future explorers not to indulge hastily in general condemnation. This lesson, however, has not been heeded, the history of Australian exploration being a history of conclusions drawn one year to be falsified the next. Hume's journey to Port Phillip at once added to the British colonial empire millions of acres of arable land watered by never-failing rivers with a climate calculated to foster the growth of almost any species of fruit or grain. It is a pity that in concluding the review of an expedition fraught with so much benefit to the colony and carried out with so much courage, hardihood and facility of resource that it cannot also be said and marked with the same cheerful spirit that pervaded those of Oxley's. But unfortunately, the evil feeling of jealousy that would arise from the presence of two leaders showed plainly throughout in petty and undignified squabbles which, in after days, led to paper warfare between the two explorers. It is painful, if amusing, to read of the disagreement as to their courses in very sight of the lately discovered Australian Alps, and how, on agreeing to separate and divide the outfit, it was proposed to cut the tent in half, and the only frying pan was broken by both parties pulling at it. Thomas Boyd, the only survivor of the party in 1883, who was then 86 years old, was the first white man to cross the Murray, which he did, swimming it with a line in his mouth. In the year named, he signed a document, giving the credit of taking the party through in safety to Hume. Boyd himself was one of the most active members of the expedition and always to the front when there was any work to be done. The training that Hume received in this and his former journey, admirably qualified him to become the companion of Sturt in his first expedition when he discovered the other great artery of the Murray system, the Darling. The young explorer was thus singularly fortunate in having his name connected with the discovery of two of the most important rivers in Australia. In the trip just narrated, he and his companion Hovel had arrested the hasty conclusion that was being formed as to the aridity of the interior. The result of their expedition held out high hopes for any future explorer, and the report they brought in was afterwards fully confirmed by Major Mitchell.